Thank you, Celie. As you know, we've previously interviewed several eminent scholars whose connections with the faculty date from the early and the mid-50s, and these have been a valuable source of information as the faculty evolved from the deprivations and the great changes that took place after the Second World War. You've been associated with the faculty for 57 years, and I hope you'll be able to provide some further reminiscences as it developed over the second half of the 20th century. Also, as we talk about your own career, I'm sure you will give us insight into changes in the teaching and the administration. And finally, in the next interview, I hope that we can visit some of your own research topics in commercial and company law. So could we start by talking about your early years? You were born in 1930 in New Zealand. That's right, yes. Whereabouts exactly? The town is called Putararu. It's a Maori name. It's in the middle of the North Island, fairly high up. In fact, when I was born, it was snowing. A rare event anywhere in the North Island, New Zealand, but it's recorded in the family archives. <laughs> Can you say something about your parents and the influences on your life in rural North Island? Yes, my father was a primary school headmaster and my mother came from a farming family. I was the third. I had two much older sisters and a younger brother, a third of a family of four. My dad moved about from job to job, so I didn't go to any one primary school for any great length of time. From 1941 to perhaps 48, you attended Stratford High School, where you did maths and Latin, amongst other subjects. Did this stand you in good stead? Oh, entirely. I mean, but for that, I wouldn't have ever got near a university, because it depended on my getting a scholarship, which I did. And the maths and Latin were very much to the fore in the subjects that I had been taught. But could say that science was not uh, at all well covered during my schooling because the men teachers who would have taught it were away at the war and that did restrict the choice of careers quite considerably. Teaching and law and the church were about the only ones on offer. And you, you were nine when the war broke out. Yes. Do you have any memories of that time? Towards the latter parts of it certainly. We were a long way from Europe, but uh, after Pearl Harbor, of course, the Japanese uh, were not that far away. They bombed bits of Australia and sent uh, submarines down to all of our parts. So we were quite uh, geared up to uh, the possibility of an invasion by the Japanese. But um, mostly it was friends, relations, neighbors serving in the war serving in the desert and in Europe, only laterally in uh, the Pacific. And do you recall the celebrations in 1945 at all? Uh, yes, but rather, rather muted. I think it was seen a little bit as an anticlimax when the, uh, um, in May, when the news came from Europe that, that it, the hostilities were over, because of course we were still fighting in uh, the Pacific, and that was very much our war then. So it was only really when the uh, bombs fell on uh, Japan and the war was over. I don't know that there was quite so much celebration then, because it was a pretty sad occasion. Yes. Now, by the time you were ready to go to university, the war was over, and I wondered what influenced you to choose Auckland in 1948. This was really, I think, because my family had always had associations with the northern quarter of New Zealand, and we did have, I had an auntie living in Auckland who offered to put me up for the first year, so that was really, I think, the only one we would have chosen. And you started off, you did a BA, LLB? It was a recognised combined course and you were allowed to credit 
jurisprudence and one of the subjects towards your arts degree uh, so that uh, you could do the two comfortably in the same five years that it would have taken to do the LLB on its own. It's, it's still that the same way in South Africa, yes. the same route. Mm -hmm. um, you, you then, you did, actually did an MA in Classics which I thought was very interesting. Yes, I'm afraid I've forgotten all the Latin and Greek I ever knew, or virtually forgotten them. But I did come under the spell of a rather um, attractive, mesmeric professor of classics. He was quite a figure on the Auckland cultural scene. He used to uh, preach in the uh, Baptist chapel on a Sunday wrote leaders for the newspaper on a Saturday. Uh, I think he also did commentary on the tennis, on the radio. But uh, I thought it was uh, an opportunity to take the studies further, most, mostly in Latin, with a little bit of Greek to back it up. Very interesting. Um, and then you did um, an LLM. Yes, well that was my original plan, but I took a year off to do the law of the, the arts. I think I mentioned that this didn't go down too well with the senior people in my legal firm, because all this time I was studying, I was also working in a law office as, as a trainee. That's right. You were simultaneously doing your bar exams and doing yes. your legal practice course. Yes. And you were admitted to the... Um, to the bar during that period? Yes, we have a fused or combined profession in New Zealand and it was normal for most of us to qualify as both barrister and solicitor. The final exams were slightly different but uh, we took them both in our stride. So that you were well placed by the time that um, you actually um, acquired a scholarship to study to come to England. Yes, uh, um, was I was 1955. actually, uh, I applied for a, a postgraduate scholarship on the strength of my arts degree and I was turned down because I'd put on the form that I wanted to study law. My professor was very upset about this, Professor Geoffrey Davis, and he took it up with the awarders and they agreed that they had no right to deny me this scholarship. So they decided to give me one, but only in the following year. So that left me free to go and do my LLM, knowing that I could go on to study overseas when um, I'd done that as well. So what made you decide on Gonville and Keys? My professor, who was a Welshman, had very close connections with uh, Dr. Ellis Lewis here in the faculty who was also Welsh, and he suggested I should go to Keyes because Professor Emlyn Wade was the Professor of Constitutional Law and would have been my supervisor. As it turned out, the Constitutional Law, um, or rather the Administrative Law subject that I wanted to work on, was one that he didn't uh, altogether approve of because he said the subject had been exhausted by Robin Cook who just left Keys and went back to New Zealand to practice. So I then switched to my second interest, which was company law, which was then a subject only just getting off the ground as an academic subject, thanks largely to the publication by Professor Gar of London of the first edition of his book, Modern Company Law, which set the standard for uh, the subject for well, right through his lifetime and is still going as a, uh, as a leading textbook. Fascinating. So when you arrived here, um, it was, I mean, the climate, it was a bit drab, still perhaps a little bit of rationing, a very different scenario to the life that you'd led in New Zealand. Did you find it quite easy to settle in? I mean, your first impressions? I was excited about the whole thing, so I didn't find anything was difficult in that sense. Uh, rationing was over, just finished, I think, and uh, 
well, the climate was exciting when the snow came. That was something I hadn't experienced in Auckland. And so I went out with my camera and took pictures. So I think gradually, no, generally speaking, uh, everything was pretty easy for me. And there was a good bunch of other postgraduate students in the college from all over the world, but particularly some from the Commonwealth. I got on very well with them. And so life in the college was very pleasant and you had very amenable friends. Do you recall any any people from those days? Yes, that was the high, high spot. The law faculty had very few postgraduate students. Um, I think there were only three of us working in common law subjects, so it wasn't the, uh, there wasn't the same opportunities to make an extensive number of friends. But most of the research students in Keys, I think were about 50 of us altogether, were scientists and they were very freely swapping ideas and it was great to be sitting in uh, on some of the conversations. Did you ever rub shoulders with Francis Crick? He, uh, later when I was a fellow, he used to come into dinner very often. We made him an honorary fellow, of course. Uh, he had been a research student at Keyes. And he was a great uh, after-dinner raconteur. And, uh, larger than life, perhaps. Yes, yes. I think of the two, Crick and Watson, Watson was the steady influence and Crick was the one who came up with the bright and sometimes impossible ideas really? and that combination turned out to work very well. Very interesting. So you left Cambridge in 1958 when you'd received your PhD and you spent a year practicing law in New Zealand and I wondered what made you decide to go back to New Zealand? Well I had no other plan ever. It was simply a lovely interlude in what was going to be a career at, at uh, the bar or behind a desk in the law in New Zealand. And uh, that's what I went back to. And that was in to, to Hamilton? Uh, yes, my parents were living in Hamilton then and hadn't seen me for three years, so it was nice to go back home and uh, live with them again. And what sort of law did you practice? I was doing uh, advocacy work all the time. Company law at all? No, uh, I had done quite a lot of company law uh, in Auckland before I came to England, but now I was a appearing before judges and magistrates with everything from traffic offences to, uh, well, quite serious um, civil cases. But I didn't have much opportunity to get a, a law report out. It was very much a matter of dealing with witnesses and um, arguing with judges without too much legal content in most of the cases. The, particularly we did a lot of accident work. We seemed to have all the plaintiffs in every factory accident and motor accident in the county and uh, the rest of the firms shared the de defendants. <laughs> <laughs> and most of the um, accident cases were before juries in those days. So again, it was a long way removed from what was in the law report. Must have stood you in extremely good stead for, for your later academic career. Well, particularly supervisions, I think. Yes. Students, uh, it, you could gain a little bit of street cred when students, yes. when, you, when you've done it, yeah. You were lured back to Cambridge in 1959 by the award of the York Prize and you obtained a fellowship at Convalent Keys. And what was your prize essay entitled? My prize essay was called, I think, Fiduciary Relationships in the Management and Promotion of Companies. That's right. I think. Yes, that's right. So the notion of fiduciary relationships uh, was very much a novelty. Almost nothing had been written on the subject apart from one very bad book which uh, I what, didn't find any great source of uh, information. The topic grew out of the law of trusts and uh, unlike a person who'd been formally appointed a trustee, 
the director of a company, a person who's acting as an agent, to some extent uh, a, a parent or guardian and so on, is placed under trust-like obligations because of the confidential relationship which exists between them. And I discovered that this subject developed very largely in the 19th and even partly in the 18th century uh, by the Chancery judges who'd grown up dealing with trust cases and they met cases of um, sharp practice and so on in the evolution of the early company which they applied the trust principles to. Since then the topic has received a lot more academic attention, particularly by Paul Finn, who was here not so long ago as a good heart professor. He wrote the leading textbook, and I think it was taken up, uh, the subject was taken up quite enthusiastically by Australian judges on the strength of that book, and it's gradually spread throughout the Commonwealth. And uh, many more PhDs have been written since my time. So at this point, did you feel yourself strongly drawn to an academic career or were you quite torn about going back and practicing in New Zealand? Yes, I had not made up my mind to be quite honest and uh, it was during the year or so after I got back to Cambridge that uh, I, uh, my relationship with my wife developed and we got married the following July. So. Even then, the choice of a future career was uh, not settled. But by the time we had a young family, Cambridge seemed to have the strongest uh, pull. So I settled for academia, and here I still am. Because at that stage, you became an assistant lecturer. Yes. And um, I wondered what that entailed. I think all appointments to the law faculty, anyway, at that stage were made at the level of assistant, assistant lecturer, at least when there was a, a new vacancy. I can't remember anyone coming in to a, a full lectureship until Granville Williams came back from London where he'd been a professor and he came back from being a professor there to being a lecturer here. Mm -hmm. So assistant lecturer was the probationary appointment Technically, it was for a maximum of five years, but in, in fact, in practice, everyone got a lectureship before that period was out, and I think I did after one and a half or two years. Then, having got a lectureship, many, many of my contemporaries at that, that stage regarded it as the career appointment. Little expectation of moving on to a readership or a chair. There were very few chairs and mostly in special special topics like Roman law and international law and so on. So um, like Michael Pritchard and John Thornley and Mickey Dias and all my contemporaries then, one thought we'd arrived and um, settled down with lecturing and teaching. Rather more teaching, I think, than the amount that is put into writing by student, by uh, academics these days, because of course the uh, demands of uh, assessment and uh, your promotion opportunities are much more extensive, and so uh, research is very much more emphasised than it would have been 40 years ago. Nevertheless, um, previous scholars have said that the teaching schedule was fairly arduous. In terms of hours, yes. In the 50s. Yes. Did, did you find that so, Professor Seeley? Yes, it was really. And yes. also the hours were very strange because um, lectures were in the mornings. The whole of the afternoon had to be left free so that they could play sport. And then at five o'clock, between five and eight, most of the supervisions were given topped up by a lot of supervisions on Friday nights and Saturday mornings by young barristers, fledgling barristers, coming up to top up their earnings. I was going to ask you about the weekenders actually, yes. it's a very interesting topic. Um, so in 1961 you were promoted to 
a lecturer in yeah. law yeah. and I wondered what the circumstances were of this promotion. To be honest, I can't remember. Um, it was something that one expects what would normally happen automatically. A vacancy must have come up and uh, I was next in line to take it. And you were also from 61 to 70 a tutor yes. at Gomber and Keys. Yes. And can you tell us a little bit about what that entailed? I think it was the same in all colleges. The students had a director of studies who was uh, their mentor so far as the study and degree and uh, study and exams went. But there was a second don. Most colleges made it being a, a don in a different subject who was there to look after the general welfare of the student and do any of the paperwork, writing references and so on, or sorting out problems over grants. If the student was ill, you saw to it that he was looked after by a doctor or hospital, what it was. If he ran into trouble with the law, you would have to arrange for him to be represented in the court case or whatever it was. It was also very much um, almost a parental relationship because uh, we would go to their parties and they would come to our parties. We, as a matter of course, had them home to lunch or dinner with, with uh, the family. And the links that were established by that relationship in many cases persisted right till today. And students come back and don't seem to forget the uh, the relationship they had with the tutor and the college, years and years after. In um, 1970, you, you became senior tutor and the admissions tutor in this position you held until 1975. Mm. Were there additional duties? Well, yes. Uh, the senior tutor organised the uh, whole of the academic side of college affairs. So it was his job to see that there were um, supervisors able to cope with all the sub subjects um, and recruiting some from outside if necessary. And following up on exam results, which students should be elected to scholarships and so on, all that side of thing was the senior tutor's job. On top of that, he was responsible for discipline so that if students were in trouble or um, in breach of college rules or something, it was the tutor and the senior tutor's job between them to see that uh, things were sorted out. Admissions tutor in those days was much less onerous than it was than it is now because we had an entrance examination on which we awarded scholarships and most of the places were awarded on the strength of the performance in that exam. And then there would be a number of borderline candidates where you had a little more discretion and could look for, for instance, people likely to make a contribution to other aspects of college life as part from passing exams. So people with musical talents or sporting talents or potential uh, political careers or something, people with special interests could sometimes get in on the strength of interviews, having performed just adequately but not spectacularly in the entrance exam. Also, we were recruiting from a much smaller number of schools. The net hadn't been spread anything like as widely as it was now, so a lot of the job of the admission tutor was to maintain liaison with schools where we had a good link. Now the admissions tutor has to go out to the highways and byways looking for uh, other schools to uh, persuade them to start thinking of sending students to Cambridge and that takes a lot of time. And you were never assigned as a lawyer, you were, you were not assigned law students? No, uh, sometimes you had one by accident, for instance, you would have a student who was reading modern languages in his second year he changed the law and you just kept him on your panel, didn't send him off to someone else. But the whole idea was that a student would have at least two shoulders to cry on, as well as the chaplain or the dean or somebody as well, if, if, if he needed um, 
to make a complaint or a protest or found himself in, in troubles. Himself, there were no girls in those days. Yes. It, it sounds <coughs> an enormous amount of work on top of your academic load as well. It's, it seems incredible to think that... Yes, I cut my supervisions down to six hours a week. I remember doing that. Um, but of course it's important to maintain connection with the students yeah. uh, in your own subjects. They are looking, expecting you to, to do the supervisions and so on. Yes. Today, many colleges have full-time senior tutors and full-time admissions tutors because the bureau bureaucratic side has built up. The paperwork is much more extensive. And in 1991, you became professor. You were appointed to the S.J. Berwyn Professor of Corporate Law. Mm. And I wondered what the circumstances were of this. Stanley Berwyn was a very successful London solicitor who f first founded the firm of what's now called Berwyn Leighton, being the senior partner and founder of that firm. After some years uh, heading that firm, he went off into uh, bank, banking law, um, not banking law, to work for, um, the, in the city, and then gave that up and went back to the law, and he founded a second legal firm, S.J. Bowen and & Co., and they're both among the top legal firms in London to this day. He was a workaholic, and reputedly lived on black coffee and cha was a chain smoker and uh, died in his 60s. Uh, the clients mainly, I think, of his second firm uh, raised money to have um, an academic post established in his memory. I believe they raised enough money for two chairs and uh, chose Cambridge to be the place where these chairs were. One of them has his name, S.J. Bowen, and the other is an innominate chair. And the Bowen chair is in corporate law. The other one has a full range of subjects. And I don't even know whether it, it's, his name is associated with the second one at all these days. It just went into the general funds. But that's how high, in what high esteem he was held. Yes. Uh, I had a rather daunting inaugural lecture to deliver because as well as uh, the members of the faculty and good representation from my college, the lawyers from Bowens came up. Mr. Bowens, widow and son and daughter-in-law came and his brother uh, So, and my own kids <laughs> and their girlfriends came so we had uh, I had to try and pitch this lecture at a level which everyone would make sense of. Whether I did or not, I don't know. But by a curious coincidence, I discovered that uh, one of my suits had the label Bowen on the inside of it. So uh, I challenged the f partners of Bowens in London about this, and they said, oh yes, uh, it was a well-established um, clothing firm based in Leeds and was still going strong under the directorship of Stanley's brother. Well, I put this suit on, had especially dry cleaned for the inaugural <laughs> lecture. And when I was introduced to the brother, he took the coat by the lapels and said something like 1948, I think. <laughs> no, 58 probably. Uh, and it was tough to realize that I'd got the suit out. He said no more, but a week later a suit arrived in the post which fitted me exactly. What a delightful story. It was a lovely story, yes. wasn't it? Mm. Yes. Mm. Goodness. And I understand that they are, the firm is a, a very enthusiastic supporter of the Leeds Rugby League, Rugby League Club. <laughs> so I can follow it indirectly with a certain interest. Yes. Mm. Gosh. Yeah. Well, that brings us to some of the personalities mm -hmm. you would have met um, over the years, starting with those who crossed your path when you first came to Cornwall and Keys to do your PhD in 1955. And here the first name is Professor Emlyn Wade. Yes, um, 
M. and Wade had written a book, Wade and Phillips, on constitutional law, which was the standard textbook. Uh, he was a magistrate and had um, aspects of his military background, I think, still show, show, showed through in his bearing and other things. And the book was very conservative. And it was just about the time I arrived that the um, iconoclasts got to work and started to write uh, more challenging books about what was happening. That, um, there was a book called The Law and the Constitution by Sir Ivor Jennings, which uh, challenged accepted views like the police can do no wrong and, <laughs> <laughs> and um, that um, discovering that there was a lot more discretion in the administration of the law than had been laid down formally by the statutes and the cases and so on. So new books started to appear which attacked the old orthodoxies. Also there was developing a, a new subject, administrative law, which I thought I would do my research in, but uh, curiously Emlyn Wade didn't think it had a great future. He was quite wrong, of course. There has been a, a, a gross subject ever since. Robin Cook, who had been a research fellow at Keyes just before I arrived, he left with his PhD in York Prize and he'd written on administrative law and Professor Wade thought he'd sucked the subject dry. <laughs> so I was discouraged to take the subject much further and I switched to company law, which was another growth subject just getting underway. And I had, I've never regretted that. Now that, that's Emlyn Wade. Uh, since, uh, uh, in the years since, we've had another Professor Wade who is actually a graduate of my own college and came back from Oxford to be master of my college. That's, that's Bill Wade, H.W.R. Wade, whose subjects also included constitutional law. But he was at that time only a lecturer based in Trinity. Uh, so uh, he'd broken his links with Keyes. When he came back as master, we were glad to have him back. Yes. The other name I mentioned was Ellis Lewis. Yes. Everybody called him Tell. Uh, and he was the academic librarian for the Squire. Uh, we had a, a full-time, I think two full-time people worked. One put the books away and the others did the admin work. Of the last, of the overall oversight of the library was in the hands of Ellis Lewis, who was a fellow of Trinity Hall and had a lectureship and I think was almost the only other member of the faculty to have a PhD. It was quite unusual for anyone to have a, a doctorate at the start of an academic career in law at that time. Ellis Lewis was a really lovely man. We didn't discover the full story till he retired. He'd been a miner and been injured in a mining, mining accident and lost most of the fingers of one hand. Good heavens. And I think on the strength of that, he decided to give up mining and to get a new career in the law. He studied at Aberystwyth, I think, um, and made uh, a very good colleague here in the faculty. We didn't discover till very late in life that he was putting half his earnings away to support another brother who had been much more seriously injured in a mining accident in Wales. Uh, it's very, very he kept catching. all that very quiet. Uh, everybody liked him. Now, who else was there about? There were. I think perhaps you mentioned Lord McNair. No, Lord McNair had been a professor both in Cambridge and at Liverpool, and then became judge of the International Court. And in his retirement, he came back to Keys, and he was a, a, a marvelous personality, um, very progressive in his outlook. Uh, and he lived, to, I remember going to his 80th birthday party, it was a great dinner where he 
uh, drank brandy and made a splendid speech. And ten years later, we had a second one when he turned 90. <laughs> and he was still going strong then. He was a, a, a we were debating whether we should uh, admit girls, women to keys. And he was a strong advocate of that in contrast with um, the Wades, who both were re rather reactionary in this kind of way. Interesting. Um, I remember um, when I came back as a fellow, uh, Professor Wade said, please stop calling me Professor. And he expected me to start calling him Wade, <laughs> which didn't come easily to a colonial. But Lord McNair took me aside and said, do call me Arnold. <laughs> And that's the difference between the two of these, yes. in a rather nice way. Yes. Um, Lord McNair had been succeeded as professor by um, Lachterpart, Ellie Lachterpart's father, and he was another very genial, very approachable, very lovely person who almost went out of his way to um, build bridges between uh, a top scholar and a young colonial PhD student just arriving in the college. Oh, who else was there? Um, Glanville Williams, perhaps? Glanville Williams um, was here as a lecturer when I arrived. He then went to London to a chair and he came back to, to Cambridge. Um, I can't remember if he came back to a chair or he came back and got a chair shortly afterwards. Glanville was quite the brightest intellect that the law faculty had had for years and years, perhaps since Maitland, I can't think of a name that would stand out in the records. Uh, perhaps some of the international lawyers might qualify as going into the same bracket. Uh, he didn't get on all that well with more senior people who were probably less well qualified than he was, uh, or less able anyway than he was. I remember him stopping me in the library once to ask a question of company law, and when I gave him the answer, I noted he wrote it down in shorthand. <laughs> and I discovered that he was actually an expert on Pittman's shorthand <laughs> and wrote leading textbooks on it. <laughs> uh, and he was very keen that everyone trying to make a, an academic career should learn shorthand and typing. I, I never succeeded with either, but. Uh, uh, Tony Smith, who actually did a PhD under Glanville's supervision, took him up and certainly became a very uh, able typist. Yeah. Um, he, he had largely established his early career in the law of tort and jurisprudence, but he then got a developing interest in criminal law, which is where he made his major mark in later years. Uh, um, perhaps Arthur Armitage, Trevor yes. Thomas? There were two very, um, very good, what's the word? They were good administrators, good leaders, good chairman of committees and so on. Both were full uh, part-time uh, justices of the peace and did work as magistrates. Very good all-round people who each of them went off to become vice-chancellors, one to Liverpool and one to Manchester. I can remember college meetings lasting all afternoon and meetings of the faculty lasting 25 minutes when yeah. either of them was the chair. <laughs> <laughs> now they're very efficient and both very likeable people, very larger-than-life characters. Uh, Arthur Armitage came back to be president of Queen's uh, I think, I don't think Trevor Thomas ever did come back. Mm. John Thornley is the... John Thornley, I bracket him with Michael Pritchard as the last examples of, in the law, of the true college man, the legendary college man, who one office after another fell to him to run in the college, whether it was registrary, um, or senior tutor, or they just did one job. Stand in for the bursar when he was on leave. They 
carried the conscience of the college remembering about ancient uh, statutes or almshouses which you had the living of this church or that and so on. They seemed to be embody the whole spirit and tradition of hundreds of years of college life. And in, in contrast, the academic, lo lo the academic side of the work in sense of research and publishing never took off in the way that it potentially could have. Um, particularly Michael Pritchard, who of course has been my senior in Keys all the time I've been there. A great scholar who gave away most of his bright ideas for other people to write books on all the way through his life. Michael came up with clever ideas which uh, he freely allowed other people to develop. Uh, and what might have happened had he become a serious, a publisher of serious books year after year, uh, we'll never know, but he could have. Yes. So John Thornley had been injured in the war, had a um, had serious operation on his head, um, and I think that perhaps inhibited the um, uh, energies he might have put into all sorts of other things, but both r really warm, affectionate people who I treasure memories of very much. So. Other colleagues whom you may recall include perhaps Professor Hampson? Yes, uh, uh, he, I, I remember largely I think because he had been editor of the Cambridge Law Journal for years and years. He had great links with um, others. I remember he was a close friend of Lord Denning's. He brought Lord Denning back every summer to give a, a talk to the foreign law students who came on the Cambridge summer course. I think he was a venture of his inn and had a lot to do there. He, he, he never published any great, any work of great standing, but he did, I think, establish a comparative law in Cambridge, which was then taken up by Tony Jollowitz and various others as, as a leading subject, and I think the comparative law came from the fact that he had fluent French and good friends in French universities. Uh, it was a subject getting off the ground then, I think. Um, I know that he told, advised Tony Jolovitz not to do a PhD. Mm -hmm. He said um, that's only for um, scientists. And no self-respecting lawyer would do a PhD. Oh, that was a widely held belief, and I think for this reason, Glanville Williams, Williams was looked at somewhat askance because he'd, he'd done a PhD, and this was something that um, in those days was rather an unusual thing to do. And as I said, there were only three, three of us doing PhDs in law um, in the Squire at the time I did mine, uh, two of us from the Commonwealth, um, Trinity in particular had a prize fellowship and it was widely thought that to have won a prize fellowship at Trinity at the age of 28 or 30 it was all you needed to have for the rest uh, of your life and it would yes. be quite lowering your dig dignity to tie and top it up with a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> um, perhaps uh, Mr. Henry Barnes, he's somebody who... Um, well, he was, a, he was quite a, a figure in the faculty, but he didn't have a lectureship. He, I think, maybe... I think he had a lectureship, but what, wasn't a fellow of any college. And he used to hire a room above uh, the Dorothy Tea Rooms, I think, to give his supervision, <laughs> that's right. Um, and... I can't even remember what he lectured on. Criminal he, law? Criminal law, possibly. I, uh, we didn't cross paths very much, but I do remember when he retired, he gave me his gown. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, he, he was, um, I think because uh, of the, the position he had, he supervised any number of students, uh, which I think he may. Oh, yes. Um, he used to distribute handouts. 
<laughs> and for that reason his supervision were very much sought after and I think he charged the students for these handouts <laughs> um, but it was generally believed that if you couldn't get on with your college supervisor the thing to do was to ask to be sent to Henry Barnes and he taught you how to pass exams anyway even if it didn't teach you to uh, have a, a, a fond memory of the subject. Perhaps I'm doing him down but that's the picture I have of him. It's very interesting mm. actually. Um, Clive Perry? Now, Clive, like Glanville Williams, was uh, um, very talented, uh, very imaginative, um, a little bit of a maverick, which didn't do any harm, I think. And he also did have a, a doctorate, and I think he did take an LLD later on. Uh, he was chairman of the faculty, I remember that. I think he was chairman when we first introduced statutes into the exams. The students could actually, didn't have to rely on their memory. But at that time, of course, statute law was overtaking common law as the main source of, uh, of um, or the main source of law. So we had to do that. I remember he was also admissions tutor for Downing College and was um, there's a book written by somebody about life at Downing which uh, involves uh, a fictitious figure of admissions tutor uh, <laughs> who's supposed to be based on the maverick figure of Clive Parry. But uh, take, don't take me wrong, he's a very serious scholar. Yes. Mm. I've been told by Professor Allett that he, he had great respect for him. Oh yes. Mm. Academically. Yeah. Um, Robbie Jennings would have perhaps crossed your path? Well, yes, Robbie's in the McNair mould, a uh, very serious um, international law scholar who in his turn became judge at the International Court. Um, and I suppose I should also mention Kurt Lipstein, but uh, everyone knows and remembers Kurt so well. Now, Kurt um, came from um, um, Uh, Kurt came in the 30s with a lot of the Jew Jewish immigrants came, came to Cambridge and um, I think he must have done the first PhD in law, yes. in Roman law yes. and I remember it being produced at his, um, when we had a dinner, at least a uh, party in his honour just before his death and uh, it, it, was, it, it was a PhD in Roman law but uh, his linguistic gifts and the way he put himself out for foreign students in pretty well any language going was breathtaking and such a lovely man. Yes. Mm. Um, he and Clive Perry shared a house. Did they? On mm. the Barton Road. They yes. built a house with a clear division between yeah. mm. as a way of affording a property on the Barton oh. Road. Mm. And eventually, um, Mr. Lipstein bought him out and then mm. he had the whole house. Mm. Mm. But um, Clive Perry was a great friend to him yes. when he was interned. Yes. Mm. And, um, I can believe that, yes. Mm. This is all before my time, but I can believe it's very true of them. Mm. Yes. Um, someone else, uh, perhaps Professor Jolovitz, you might, you might have memories of? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, let me think, he would already have been a fellow of Trinity when I arrived. Um, I remember he drove an E-type Jaguar <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, I think that... Um, uh, uh, Ellis Lewis edited, you know, I didn't ever meet Professor Winfield who had died just before I came and tell did the sixth edition, I think, of his book on tort, and then Tony Jolivitz took it over. And Tony uh, really succeeded the, in the Winfield tradition as a tort lawyer, and in the Hampson tradition as a comparative lawyer. And he, he uh, very much built up comparative law uh, as a subject, and specialised quite a lot in procedural law, rather than the law itself, but the way the law was, was um, 
and ministers and applied in the different countries. And he has a goodly network of friends overseas, both in France and in Mexico, I think, particularly. Yes. In Mexico? I mean, that's correct. Yes, that's yes. right. Yes. But a very genial colleague, and of course his wife, Poppy, well, we've known them all the time. We've lived in Cambridge. And, uh, uh, lovely, lovely people. Mm, mm. Um, other uh, colleagues or academics who crossed your path from between 1960 and 1997 would have included Derek Bowett. Yes. Um, Derek being in international law, yes. of course our paths <coughs> didn't cross all that much. Yeah. Um, that, again, once the uh, international law got its own building, we saw rather less of them. Of course, on things like academic committees and so on, and again, as president of Queen's, as he was, I, I, I met him in that capacity and socially. Um, and I know him, they had friends in our village and I met them socially rather more than I had any academic contact with him. But again, very distinguished. We haven't had an undistinguished national lawyer, I think, in history. Uh, this is the mecca for all the pe top people. Um, um, year after year, we recruit the best and send out the best postgraduate students, I think. Cambridge can certainly claim that still. Mm. Um, not an international lawyer, but a very esteemed legal historian, Professor Peter Stein. Yes, yes, I, I, well, Peter was an undergraduate at Keyes, in fact, and I yes. think... Um, I think it was his father there, perhaps. Yes, well. and Peter's second name was Gonville. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so there was strong family loyalty there. Yes. Well, again, Peter's subject being primarily Roman law, it was not a subject I had any um, any knowledge of really, um, not since undergraduate days and so on. So I met him mainly socially and when he was chairman of the faculty and so on, and administrative and, and social way, yes. Mm. Um, the other one I should perhaps mention, David Williams came to yes. us. Um, came, he came to straight into a, a full lectureship, I think, at the same time that uh, Peter. Uh, Peter, the name's Jesus, Jesus College, criminal lawyer. Um, G, begins with G. Claysbrook. Yes, Claysbrook. They both came together, I think. And they'd both been at Nottingham or something like that, I think, as came together. David came to Emmanuel, and our careers went in parallel for a, quite a time because he was senior tutor and admission tutor at Emmanuel. Uh, we were we were born in the same year and celebrated birthdays <laughs> uh, on laugh together and so on. And I, I remember when he turned 70, he had a dinner for all his friends who were turning 70 that year, which included me. Did and I, 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 I knew both him and Sally extraordinarily well. There was a certain rivalry between Keyes and and the manual, whether it was in tripus results or in um, rugby blues and so on, which we kept going. Uh, he's one, one of the oldest and best friends. And of course, achieved distinction as a legal scholar first, and then built up this enormous network of connections in the States and through the Commonwealth, which he built on when he became Chancellor, Vice Chancellor. Uh, Chancellor. Um, and left, I think, a, a huge legacy in the terms of the networking that he built up as Chancellor, which has gone from strength to strength ever since. So he had a really extraordinary career. Yes. Sadly, um, I didn't have the chance to interview him. Very sad. That Very would sad. Be. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Professor Heppel. You might have. Yes, I don't. I mean, I've known all these people as colleagues, but um, not really in a great position to uh, sit in. I mean, Bob himself had an extraordinary career. Yes. And uh, not least when, when it began in South Africa and when it yes. left South Africa and came here. And then um, a stint in um, 
judicial capacity as a, as a labour lawyer and then back to be master of Queen's. No, uh, Claire, yeah, no, great friend, good company socially. A really lovely person. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned, Professor Seeley, the great tradition of international law here, and Professor Allett is still publishing very much these days, and yes. still mm -hmm. has a very interesting, has had a very interesting trajectory. Do you have any recollections at all of him? I've had very little. Uh, he's, he's, he's a quiet, rather shy chap. Not, not had much contact socially. He's not been very keen on administration and so on. So, um, again, he, I don't think he's ever served on a faculty board, or if he did, it was for a very brief time. He's lived with his books, but um, uh, he, he, I suppose for many of us, he was our mentor in matters relating to the common market, and whether you should call it the EU or the EC and this kind of, yes. kind of thing. So he did um, wean those of us not doing uh, common market law, EU law, very much in, into coming to terms with and understanding a lot about it. Yes. But it, it has had an impact. I mean, company law has. Um, it, huge amount of regulation from Brussels all the time. So we've got to learn to live with our community law. Yes. And he was, a, I think, quite a, a pioneer in bridging the gap between us common lawyers and those of us who now have to live as part of the EU. Yes. Well, of course, Kurt. Kurt, Kurt he was a great player in that way. Yes. Um, Professor Cornish? Well, Bill and I became professors on the same day, I think. <laughs> um, and so it's only since then that I got to know him but again, mainly as, as a fellow colonial and, and a chum. Yes. But much respected. And yes. The um, three children which we have were all, have all become scientists and I was very really pleased that there were no lawyers there because I thought that was going to make a much more creative contribution to the world than, than sitting in a, a law office. And then my, my youngest daughter, having done eight years as a biochemist and got a PhD in Oxford first, suddenly decided to become a patent lawyer and had to buy Bill Cornish's book. <laughs> so we've got a lawyer in the family now. After all. <laughs> a patent attorney, anyway. So but I've had odd jokes with Bill about that. And what an impressive provenance as a scientist first. Well, yes, that is the area where patent law is. Uh, it's a growth area in patent law. Now, whether it's in pharmaceuticals or... Um, um, gene, gene, gene splitting and gene this and that, or, and I think that and probably petrochemicals are the, the big growth areas in patent law now, not mouse, mouse traps and corkscrews any longer. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have any recollections of Professor Beetson as he was then before he went to the High Court? Um, Well, not particularly, apart from the fact that he was a contract lawyer and I was a contract lawyer. Again, got to know him well enough and as, as a friend. And um, still, um, well, he, wrote, he edited the Anson on contract, didn't he? And so on. So uh, um, I remember using that book when he, when he, once he edited it, uh, in preference to Jeff from Fivefoot for Cambridge students. There's, a, there's always um, a time, I think, when an old book will die the death unless it gets, in, gets into a new pair of hands. And uh, Anson was really revived from nowhere, just as we had to do with Benjamin on sale, which is another 19th century classic which almost petered out and has been re relaunched as, as a current book. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. So, before we close this section on personalities, there's one academic I'd like to ask you about, Professor Sidi, and that's Tony Weir. Yes. Um, who was a great, very impressive intellect in the faculty. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I wonder whether you have any recollections of him. Oh, endless recollections of Tony. Uh, he's, um, he's another, of course, who's kept the comparative law thing going and going from strength to strength. He was very um, hospitable to all the foreign law students who came on the summer course. He's written very profoundly, both in contract and in tort. Um, in his case book on tort, of course, um, I did a case book on company law and I'm sure I borrowed a lot of ideas as regards the structure and approach of the book from that very successful book that he wrote. I remember him mostly, apart from um, knowing him as a person, for his contribution to the Cambridge Law Journal, particularly the case notes, because they were wickedly funny often. In fact, one of them, um, Professor Hampson, when he was editor, declined to publish because he thought it was a little too mocking of uh, the House of Lords, I think. <laughs> but, um, there was always a splendid quip or a pun or something in just about everything he wrote. And the students would fall on his case notes with, with great glee um, because I think he, he just brought a, a new dimension, a, a bit of life into, into what he wrote. We um, always surprised that he didn't ever take a chair, although I know he was offered a chair on more than one occasion. He, he, wanted to stay, I think, um, where he was, happy with his supervisions and his writing and his, his contacts outside that. Very sad that he should go when he did. In fact, I had lunch in Trinity a week before he died and had a good chat with him. No idea that this was in the, in the offing. Mm -hmm. Very sad. Professor Seeley, that brings us to your sabbaticals. Mm -hmm. In 1968, yes. you had a sabbatical at ANU when you were a lecturer, mm -hmm. and I wondered about any memories you might have had of that. Well, it was a great break. Uh, there was a the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies at Canberra was separate from the law faculty and uh, had no teaching responsibilities or even any sharing of uh, the members there were not um, expected to go and teach in the law faculty so it was pure research apart from some in-house seminars and I was not given any um, brief as to what I was to do there it was up to me to find my own way of using the time I was invited I think by Professor Sam Stolger who like um, Kurt Lipstein was a refugee from uh, pre-war Germany, a uh, linguist of some skills and uh, also a very keen legal historian. And he'd written some books in the areas of contract, agency and so on. And I think it was through those that I got to know him. Anyway, they had money to offer to visitors and uh, I was invited to apply for a whole year sabbatical there and off we went with two small children. It was uh, it was a very happy year altogether for many ways. I started to work uh, on this ancient book Benjamin on Sale which the publishers thought could be brought into the 20th century but after a few months I realized it was more than I could do it myself so it was then uh, arranged that they should get a team of six or seven authors to write a, a third of the book each. And as I'd, I'd already written a third, <laughs> um, it was natural that I should, should go into that. Uh, I also started work on my ca company law case book. At the time, there was one, one case book on law published by the Cambridge University Press Turner and Armitage and they got the idea that they should duplicate or rep, uh, replicate this book across the board so somebody was to do tort and somebody to do contract and so on and um, I found myself doing company law. It was a pretty poor book when it was published <laughs> partly because the press only 
only allowed you to do extracts from the cases and you were allowed a one line strap line across the top to summarize what it was about. So it wasn't a very useful teaching tool. And then but, uh, a chap called Jeffrey Wilson did one on um, constitutional law, John Hall, uh, who's another college man, much respected, John Hall at St. John's, uh, who died prematurely. John Hall did one on family law and so on. But the press decided that they were, wasn't making money on law books and so it gave up law publishing temporarily. It was persuaded to go back to it, I think, by Bill Wade later. But um, so Butterworth took the title over and they gave me free reign to reshape the book so I could put in comments and I ask the students questions and so on. Uh, do get that, please. It shouldn't be. I thought you had taken it off the hook. It's a bit somewhat annoying. The, the answer phone will pick it up, will I? Yeah. It's a bit annoying. I took it off the hook and it's still ringing. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> it stopped anyway. Um, so the second edition of the book was much more to my liking and uh, it's been a successful book ever since. And to my great joy, when I decided to ease up on the writing, Sarah Worthington took over the editing of it and she's just finished I think the 10th edition in manuscript is going off this week and so um, that was the other work which I did while I was at Canberra but I did also some work for the uh, federal government um, not, not on a paid basis but uh, on a pro bono basis and um, was invited to give seminars and lectures in Melbourne and Sydney and Monash and other places while I was there. Sounds like a marvellous year, packed with very fruitful activity. Oh, surely. Uh, the building we worked in was built like a honeycomb, so that everyone had out, uh, access to the light for both sides, but where the uh, any two, no, any three, uh, branches joined, there would be a, a caf cafeteria. Uh -huh. So if I went to have coffee in a westerly direction, I might have political scientists to share my coffee with. If I went in an eastern direction, it might be an economist in another direction. So that there was a great e exchange of, um, of chat there, not yes. necessarily very serious, but it was very, a very enlightening way, I think, to lay yes. out a research institute. Yes. And I met some um, particularly Jeffrey Sawyer, who was S A W E R, who was uh, the head of the institute and a, a, a very um, a leading, or the leading expert on the Australian Constitution, a, a very jolly and slightly cheeky chap. I was a great mentor to have there. You had other sabbatical visits to Auckland, Melbourne, Bond, in Queensland. Yes, Auckland was simply, I went out and did a, a term of teaching because I hadn't seen my family for seven years or something. Uh, so there was, I didn't do any study then. It was just a, a visiting, a more or less teaching. And again, I had quite a bit of um, contact with the profession and gave public lectures and so on. Um, then I was uh, offered a visiting lectureship, visiting professorship at Melbourne sponsored by a firm of solicitors who had um, linked firms in all the state capitals in Australia and as well as teaching in both Monash and Melbourne University I went round with uh, one of their partners or two of their partners to the other firms giving in-house in seminars and sometimes public lectures as part of the stint. We went one week uh, Monday was Brisbane, Tuesday was Sydney, Wednesday was back in Melbourne to uh, change of shirts and things. <laughs> <laughs> then it went on to Adelaide and finally to Perth. Um, we gave, we each gave a seminar in the morning and a seminar in the afternoon in each of these places. And what was most interesting to me was how different the seminars were <laughs> in the different places. Really? But we were talking about takeover bids. And in Queensland, 
everybody in the building when I was talking about it seemed to be somebody who'd been the victim of a takeover raid. When we got to Perth, everyone in the building was a raider who was rubbing his hands at the success of the So the seminars were quite uh, a contrast, although it was the same theme and the same, I said much the same things. The feedback was totally different. That was quite good. Uh, and since then I've been invited back to Australia two or three times. That's where I have chosen to go, partly because I've got roots into Australia quite well established now, and partly because opportunity to stop by in New Zealand and see friends and family there. Yes. And for that reason I've, well, I've not usually spent seminars, no, sorry, sabbaticals anywhere else. Um, I've been on short um, things to Geneva and uh, Tilburg in Holland and Canada and so on, but only two or three weeks at a time. I did a five week stint in Japan once, I think, but I think that was possibly after I'd retired, I can't remember, well, otherwise it was when I was on a, on a sabbatical anyway. And South Africa, you had a, you visited South Africa? Yes, I've gone to South Africa mainly for conferences. Um, I suppose the reason largely is that Johan Henning at uh, uh, Brumfontein became a good friend because his subjects company Lawrence is mine and through Barry Ryder and others and we got links going there. So when um, I think just really before uh, yes, I think that's right. Yes, just before the, the, the election, and uh, yeah, that's right. It was, it was some time before then. I'm trying to think whether Mandela uh, was already in office. I don't think he was. Uh, he was about to uh, become. He wasn't in office because I actually went to. Uh, I went to. Um, hmm. What's the Afrikaans University in Johannesburg? The Runt, the Runt Afrikaans Must have been, I University. Think, yeah, I think that's right. I went there to hear him give a lecture where he was very apologetic that he didn't want to speak more than one paragraph in Afrikaans before he switched to English, which was greatly at my <laughs> <laughs> advantage. Um, yes, uh, one of your leading judges organised a conference in Joburg. Um, really to try and bring a lot of glasnost into, um, into post-apartheid South Africa and we had a lot of labour lawyers there and a lot of con company lawyers and I spoke at that and I was, while I was there I was invited down to, well, up to Pretoria and I went also down to Bloemfontein, met all the Supreme Court judge or a High Court judge was having a public lecture there. And we went off to Lesotho for a day, which was quite fun too. Yes. And on the strength of that, I've been invited back. Uh, there was a, I'm having trouble with names now, there was a banking lawyer who had a conference in Pretoria every year. And I went out to that every year to say something about a company or, or insolvency law to that. And then they made him a judge, so that conference dried up, so I haven't been back since, except that we had a week in South Africa on our way to New Zealand last year, I drove the garden route. And, oh, yeah. lovely. Mm. But yeah. all these different links developed a conviction in Commonwealth law, which um, became quite, quite a big interest in, in, in its own right, apart, apart from just study, because that's a series called International Corporate Procedures, and this book called Brown, I was invited to become Commonwealth, Commonwealth editor of that. So I had to read all the Commonwealth judgments in company law all the time. Yes. And this one on strength of it, it's not just Commonwealth, that's a, it's a, just a, a handbook for practitioners telling them how to set about forming a company in, in Timbuktu or wherever you might want to be. We got digested the tax laws and the company laws and, um, and so on laws of, I didn't say Timbuktu, I should have, should have said um, 
the Virgin Islands or somewhere where <laughs> they do have companies. <laughs> um, but it meant that, um, again, I went to a lot of conferences on the strength of that. So although I'm not a comparative lawyer in the uh, Hampson Jolowitz sense, I, um, and that, that came in when I was doing this legal drafting in Malawi and Vesuto and uh, sorry, Vanuatu and various other places. Would you come on to that later? Yes, very, very interesting indeed. That brings us to topics related to the faculty and the mm. university and your lengthy association with the faculty as a lecturer from 1961 to 97, 36 years, and then your association with its administration um, puts you in a very strong position to reminisce on some of the major and in some cases traumatic upheavals. Yes. <laughs> so when you first arrived as a postgraduate in 1955, mm. my first question is what you felt about the weekenders whom you would have encountered because various scholars have had differing opinions of the weekenders. Some have thought they were just wonderful and others not quite so. Yes, because I, I, I never was on the receiving end of a supervision from a weekender. Uh, I think on the whole they were people on the way up and have entered as quite senior barristers or judges. Um, they would have taken enough of a, a wider interest in the subject to have got um, Got the, got the topic across well to the students. I think they're probably, on the whole, quite lively personalities, not all that bookish and, bookish and retiring. It, it was a... Um, it was just a new dimension to their lives, and I think that would explain why they were lively people. I don't... I, I don't really believe that the content of the... Uh, Tripos in those days was as demanding as it's become now. The law was less complex, the students were on the whole less bright, or rather they ranged from the very bright to the, to the less bright, and so supervisions could take a, quite a number of, be taken to quite a number of levels depending on what the students wanted yes. <laughs> and what the supervisor could give. And the best of them, coming from practice, where he could talk um, with authority on what goes on in practice, they must have been as good as anything they'd get. Uh, there must have been some fairly mundane, plodding ones, but I don't know. I wouldn't like to put a name on anybody who I've brand in that way. Mm. But going back to my time as a student in New Zealand, we were taught a lot of the time by practitioners some of whom were very able and conscientious and some of whom were extremely lazy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one we used to get up and buy the evening newspaper and read it in his lectures as a way of getting message to him that we could get the subject better out of a book than we get it from him. Very unkind. But I don't think there was any such uh, feedback from the students. There, there could well have been um, colleagues who thought the students were getting second best teaching. But if that was the way, you just couldn't afford full time uh, college officers like we've got these days. I know that Professor Jolovitz was a weekender. He would have been, yes, yes. because he, he did have time at the bar and still remained his, retained his links at the bar. And I, I'm sure students wanted to go on to practice law do get a, a great deal out of a supervisor who's, or a lecturer who's seen even even a tiny bit of practice like I did. Lord Lane is another name that springs to mind. No, I didn't who's, know Geoffrey uh, Lane at apparently, all. Apparently, uh, no, very he, colourful. He, yes, yes so I, I've met him a couple of times in, in later life, but no, I, I know he came up as a weekend uh, and he's maintained links with members of the faculty. No, I don't know, know anything about him, really. Professor Seeley, um, you alluded to the way that the you said the teaching in earlier times with the tripos was less demanding. Um, you've seen major changes in the 
teaching techniques, the syllabus and attitudes to students. And I wondered if you could just highlight I some of these changes. I think what I was saying more was that the content of the subjects is, is much more demanding now. Um, students came and uh, as well as doing Roman law for one year and sometimes I think all his for two years in those days, uh, the, they did the historical introduction to the English legal system, the historical introduction to contract and tort, historical introduction to constitutional law, historical introduction to property law. In the first year they didn't study any real law at all. They were all paving the way, really, for later courses. So that meant that at the further end of the tripos, there was no company law, no trusts, no equity, uh, no tax law, all the subject we can do now. The result is that there's much more content right from the start. They learn, they do the law of contract, the law of tort, and so on, criminal law, to its full extent and in depth right from the start. Um, so it's that that's changed rather than teaching techniques and so on. Um, obviously uh, the size of classes has grown so you've got um, bigger classes but you've got audio, audio visual aids and things, even duplicated handouts weren't uh, common in my day. So uh, it's that that's changed more than in anything else. and. We offered courses in Roman Dutch law and Scots law and so on, which were really only a gloss on what they were learning in English law. And so a person doing the practice law in Scotland and what could do in English contract and English tort and then Scottish contract and Scottish delict and so on, not getting a very wide uh, coverage of, of law at all. It, it, um, it's it's uh, looking back on it. I think also the exam questions weren't as hard. That was weren't as uh, um, weren't as open ended. A student could learn off what was expected to know and write it out, and uh, he'd get a safe second. And it was only the really keen ones who read more widely and, and sh shone at the top. Whereas it's very hard to get an unkeen student these days. They're all after a 2-1, uh, at least if they can get it. And uh, very conscientious about it. I think the supervision to reflect that, set more essays. It seems to become a lot more professionalised. Very Absolutely. And the very fact that, that we have um, research assessments and so on means that the teachers are on, on the wall all the time. They, the, there's no um, sinecures left for the Henry Barneses of this world. <laughs> not, I don't want to disparage Henry, but no, no, he wasn't expected, wasn't asked and didn't seek to do any more than put the basics across to the student in an assimilable way and make sure they understood them. That, that, was, uh, that was 1950s yes. uh, teaching, uh, 1960s teaching, and it was only as in fact, talking of Glanville Williams, he was very much a pioneer in enlarging the tribal syllabus. I mean, we had great votes as to what subject should be in which years and what new subjects should come in at the top and what elementary subjects should go out at the bottom. And uh, Glanville also was a great pioneer of teaching methods which the students didn't like because this involved him asking them questions and expecting them to have read the subject up before the lecture, which he'd done in the States and thought was a great way of learning. But it was not a subject which 1960s English students took to at all. Professor Hipple tried to take that on mm -hmm. as well. Yes. You can do it much more easily, uh, particularly in the LLM and the half subjects now. LLM, you've got students from uh, all sorts of backgrounds who are very well qualified, a lot of them sometimes have been practicing law in their own jurisdictions and so on. Yes. I remember once when the assessor came and he wasn't supposed to drop in on my insolvency lectures, but he did. Gate crashed my lectures and this happened. I was sitting in the back of the class and I had a Canadian and an Australian standing in front having a debate with each other while the students took down notes. 
And so he, the assessor ticked all the boxes as this must be, must be a good way of teaching. <laughs> and then he confessed, I had to drop in because I'd been bankrupt myself, you know. <laughs> 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 Which is not the best qualification for becoming a university <laughs> academic assessor. <laughs> yeah, but the, there wouldn't have been any of that when I started lecturing to try past part one. Um, Professor Seeley, for most of your time, the faculty was in a sense homeless, partly in the old schools and then scattered in Mill Lane. And I wonder if you could summarise the changes in the accommodation and some of the administrative problems yes. over this period and how it mm. actually affected mm. the operation mm. of the faculty. Well, I suppose behind it all is the fact that bureaucratic demands have grown, not least on the old schools, so they've just had to expand and expand as there's more and more um, pressure put on them that way. Uh, and so gradually we did have several rooms in the old schools and they took them over one by one, sometimes by negotiation and sometimes behind our backs, but uh, that bit now, I suppose it could go on the record. <laughs> uh, room three was the one big lecture room we had and that was uh, taken out of our possession one long vacation and uh, they were about to sell the um, all the desks and chairs and so on, and we had to remind them that they had given us a written undertaking that this occupation was temporary. So they had to go into storage. It never was temporary. The, um, we had the uh, East Room in the old schools, which was a nice large room, but very poor acoustically. You had to shout. Uh, it wasn't a, a good one for the students to take notes in. Um, so gradually we went into bits of Mill Lane and the um, dining site and so on. Um, and over here, once the city got going, some lectures were here. It meant very a lot of difficulty, both for us and the students, having to get from one classroom to another in the 10 minutes, especially, especially if the lecturer overran for a few minutes, then the whole equity class would be late for the company law class or whatever it was. And the administration, that was part of the little, you remember the little couple of rooms we had in Mill Lane there? Um, for the, for the, the secretary and chairman of the faculty. So it was recognised that we had to have a new building and they, they planned for that without knowing where they were going to put it or who was going to be the architect. And they toyed with the idea first of going up Barton Road to the rifle range site, which is way out of town, and drew up plans for a building which, in many respects, was going to be isolated and self standing, although they wouldn't buy the idea that it should have any catering facilities there, which would have been daft not to have. Um, and then this deal with Keys came up. Was, uh, the university wanted more land here on the, the uh, West Road side and the uh, existing Squire Law Library was not big enough for the Squire even after we'd taken over the history building upstairs. So Keyes uh, propositioned uh, the old schools that we should have the Squire as it then was and in exchange make available to the university some land here next to Harvey Court, which is where we and criminology and the new Alison, uh, uh, Alison, Alison Richards building now stand. And so there was a swap of land with a considerable amount of cash going from us to the university, but we did get the very lovely building that the squire had been in, which now holds, houses, houses our library and all our um, computer labs and so on for the students. And Pease is very lucky because there wouldn't ever be another chance to get t uh, new premises in the centre of town near to Keys. And uh, I think the law faculty's done pretty well ahead of moving here. Um, and then uh, we had the competition to choose an architect. 
and I sat on the committee which interviewed all the architects. I think we had about nine for a start. And after the nine had submitted, they were paid to submit projects. Uh, they'd put theirs in, we cut it down to three, and we had further presentations from the, the remaining three. And although the committee would like to have had one of the others, the university re regarded the foster proposition, taking into account the funding and other things, as a, as a better deal. I mean, he had a known reputation for finishing jobs on time and on budget and so on. I expect that was a consideration. I wasn't party to the university's deliberations, but um, it'd be interesting to know what sort of building we'd had if we hadn't had Foster, because he was, a, I think he was a great, um, well, a great architect. So his building had been a great success to him. So then there was the question of what should go in this building and what should not. And uh, once again, we failed to get any response on the catering uh, questions, which explains why this so such poor plumbing in this building for, for, for uh, anything like uh, um, canteen. It's not going to be so bad now that we do have an ex extra source of food here on the site, but when there was only economics and us, um, it was a good thing that Nadine came along with her, uh, Nadia, Nadia. Really, yeah, with her sandwiches for a while. Um, so, uh, as, as I, I read, wrote you a note about Norman yes. Foster, he came up for a weekend, apparently, and did his preliminary sketches, and that was the vision he had for the building, which is the building we've got. And uh, although he changed all sorts of details, it's still in, um, in, in shape and general aspect. It's the building he planned, except that he did plan it to be an L-shaped complex with criminology going off towards the road at an angle. But uh, that, that uh, never went ahead in, in the long run. And um, as I said, whenever we had uh, questions, he was very receptive to talking about this through and going away and having another thought, almost always came back with a better solution and would say, oh, and you'll save money. <laughs> and that's a, a rare thing in an architect, I would think. Yes. Well, something that I wondered um, concerns a remark by Professor Barry Ryder mm -hmm. in your fish grift. On page 18, he says, you, and I quote, skillfully negotiated the agreement of colleagues to contemplate the deal which fu funded in major part the building of the new Cambridge Law Faculty. And I wondered whether the deal is just a, a term that he used or what, whether there was actually a deal. I'm sure the deal was either between the master or the bursar of keys and some somebody like the um, Secretary General of, of the uh, old schools, I think. That's where the ideas were originated, yeah. Uh, there's just one, one other thing that um, strikes me, and, th and that is some comments made, particularly by visiting scholars, that they feel that the colleges in the Cambridge system, with the colleges, tends to suck the sort of lifeblood away from faculties. Mm. Um, do, you, do you agree with this? Do you think no, this is true, and more particularly with the traditional colleges, which have a basic quota of undergraduates and um, postgraduate students who live in, and uh, the focus of college life is almost entirely on them and their well-being and their social life and so on. Uh, for this reason, when I'm ever asked by a visitor what he should do about a college, I say, Wolf St. Clair Hall, uh, there are colleges, graduate colleges usually, which have a great, much greater number, a greater turnover of visitors, and which cater for them sometimes to accommodation, but certainly with dining arrangements and that sort of thing. Uh, they'd be much, they get much more out of such, such a college. Unless, of course, it's a college they've already got links with, where they might want to go back the feeling they're going home again. Yes. Mm. Yeah. And um, 
people like the way David Williams uh, ran Wilson when he was head there. He, met, he never forgot a name, and he was making people, introducing people to new people and so on. He's extraordinarily good at that. And other friends um, and uh, colleagues who've gone to Clare Hall uh, find the same thing that uh, it, its focus is, of course, only on visitors and pretty well all on visitors. Churchill comes in between because although it's an undergraduate college in the full sense, it, it does have quite a lot of uh, accommodation and I think concern for visitors. It's a slightly less stuffy college in some ways as far as I don't know whether they have grace in Latin or what, but I think um, wives go in and out to meals and so on, I mean, I mean, visitors' wives in a way which might not be usual if they'd come to Keys or Trinity Hall or, or, or whatever other college you, you, you could think of of the traditional kind. Thank mm. you. Yeah. Well, for Celie, that actually brings us to the end of this interview. Mm. And next time I hope that we can talk about your scholarly work. Let's so try. all that remains it, for me is to thank you so much for a fascinating account. Well, which I've greatly enjoyed. I'm extremely hope, grateful to you. I hope it shed a light on one or two questions. Oh, it has. Thank mm. you so much. Mm.